without further ado, I'm going to present the first talker of the first speaker of this workshop, which is Ruth Navaiti. Uh, she's going to talk about active perception, and she's always a great inspiration for us, so we're very happy to have her here. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, I will sit down. <laughs> so, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, please don't hesitate to, inter to interact with me as this workshop is about interaction. Um, I initially, when I, I mean, invited to these kind of uh, presentations, I tried to talk about what I'm doing now and real results, and I will have that. But uh, the organizers came back and said, well, Arushna, why don't you give a little background about active perception? So some of about the first 15 or 20 slides will be a little bit historical so that you can see that a lot of these questions about perception and control are not new and they really go back to the early days. Okay, so what is active perception? As you can see, the psychologists long before the engineers were addressing the problem, what information are we gathering for a given task? It was always recognized that basically you are perceiving and processing data based on task and how we use stored and represented information. So the, those of us who work in perception are constantly struggling with this, that how much information is outside and how much do we store here? And, and how does two interplay? So J.J. Gibson, who has been my inspiration and was a psychologist at Harvard University, suggested that the environment contains all the necessary information that one needs for a given task and we absorb through our perception only as much as one needs to carry out it, and he called them affordances. So we can summarize it the following way. We look, not only see. So this is right now already an active process. And we feel, not only touch. This implies the following engineering agenda, which I formulated around 1980 and started the Grass Club, which actually had in its name general robotics active sensory perception because of this. So what it said was, and remember, I, I came from Czechoslovakia with the, with the control systems background, and then, um, which of course in those days was strictly linear systems background. And um, although I, I saw Pontryagin and these big Russian guys who would come to to my university. <clears throat> but then when I came to Stanford, I got indoctrinated with the logic and the discrete representation and so. Anyway, so, so what is the active perception as an engineering agenda? Need model of the observer. And the control people had this concept of observability, but the patent recognition people didn't pay much attention to that need model of the task, specific or exploratory. I mean, you know, if you don't know anything and you are not, then, then you just have to explore. Need model of the environment and need model of interaction, which is the control. So that was the agenda. And so the components of active perception, most higher le level biological organisms have available light, broadly speaking i.e. visual detectors. They especially humans. Now remember, not all biological systems have a light detector. OK, so they have to use something else to get around, like bats, for example, have ultrasound. OK, so but those who have, have saccadic eye movement, head movement, and body movement. And, and right there comes the control part. Auditory and ultrasound detectors are also active with head and body movement. Okay, proprioceptors, which are on your skin, uh, which include position, touch, and force detectors, are available almost all biological systems. Uh, in fact, they are much more primitive than, than visual system. And those of you 
perhaps who watch the biological literature know that, that actually the eye is an evolutionary from the skin. Um, <clears throat> OK, so in humans, some material properties, such as hardness, surface texture, and weight. So for example, Lederman and Klatsky in 2000 have, uh, have documented and shown that if you don't know anything, and people are asking you blindly um, how, how hard the object is, or the, the material is, you will be invariably perpendicularly pressing on the surface. Uh, if you want to know the, the surface texture, you will do this kind of motion. So, <clears throat> and uh, specific action is pressing, rubbing, and lifting as respectively. They call it haptic exploratory procedures. So, again, from psychological literature, it is clear that some con simple control strategies are innate. For example, sucking. If you had a child, then you know then that the first thing the baby does is, is start to do sucking, OK? Um, as an example, others are over time refined, such as focusing. We, have, we are born with focusing capability, but it gets improved as time goes on. Reaching, if you watch newborn babies, they sort of do this, but then eventually they, they focus what they, how they grasp, OK? And others are learned as walking. Walking is, is learned. Biological systems are very efficient, which of the sensors they apply for given task. Consider bees who have different control strategies for landing and sucking. So um, OK, saccadic eye movement, a window where to look. So the, thank you, the famous Yarbus, uh, 1967, shows that subject looks at the different parts of the scene depending on the task. Similar results have been obtained later, 2009. There are several books in this area. Land and Tatler is one of them. The important observation is that, this, and this is really the message I want to bring back to all of us, saccadic eye movement lasts 30 milliseconds, with, during which the eye is blind. So in certain milliseconds, but then you follow with fixation. So you have to really time only for 300 milliseconds to process what you are observing. So that is really a constraint. And all these fancy uh, computer vision algorithms that we have that take you know several minutes are not good enough. <clears throat> So here is the, I mean, so just to remind you, some of you, Yarbus 67, here is the picture. The visitor is coming in. And here are the saccadic eye movements for three minutes, the same subjects on four separate occasions. And you can see that although there are some variations, but there is a certainly a, a certain pass of the eye as it moves. Uh, from the, 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 the woman who's standing and then further. So the same is about but for different subjects. So even different people have similar, you know, saccadic eye movements, or at least this part is definitely, you know, kind of invariant. <coughs> okay. So. So what can we learn from psychology is the fact that fixation lasts 300 milliseconds after which the eye moves on to another post suggests time constraint. OK, how much processing can be, sh can be and should be performed? The saccadic eye movement suggests that the information pickup is patch-wise and goal-oriented. If saccadic eye movement is not sufficient, it will be followed by the head and body movement. Um, so as indicated about, we must consider three different coordinate systems because you want to be consistent not only with your saccadic eye movement, with your head movement and, and body movement. And, um, and um, from robotics, we know how to deal with these transformations. So and again, I regret to say that some of my vision colleagues completely ignore this. From robotics, we know how to transform from one coordinate system to another. The interesting point here is in which coordinate system we store the information. 
And that is a debate, you know. In fact, Bertolt Horn, I don't know, 30 years ago or so, it just shows how old I am, um, talked about object-centered or, or head-centered or eye-centered, the, 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 what do we store in the memory? And my view on that is that from the robotic point of view, one has to be very pragmatic and store it whatever way you are going to use use it. So, <clears throat> OK. So here is a block diagram for eye body control. I don't want to tell you, you, those of you who are systems engineers, which most of you are, I presume, would understand this kind of, you know, here is the voluntary trunk rotation, trunk movement, voluntary head rotation command, and saccadic. So they all have to somehow play in coordination or in sequence. OK, so here is a, um, so after I started this, uh, this movement on active perception, uh, clearly, as an engineer, I, sta I, I started to build up such a system. And it was very clunky, and you know, I couldn't do anything more than kine kinematic control. It was very, very simple. But then, um, at KTH, and is anybody here from KTH? No. Um, in Stockholm, uh, Jan Alof Eklund um, got, uh, you know, got money and, and got a very good engineer who built a superb system. And here it is, um, the, the foveal and the, and the head and virgins. And it really had capabilities that were comparable to human capabilities. And so he worked with Jan Kuntering, who, was, um, who is a Dutch uh, cognitive scientist and who was very much interested in, can we make mathematical models of the human control system? And so Jan, Jan, uh, Jan Olof Eklund was able to, to demonstrate that, yes, we can, given the money. So then <clears throat> in 1985, my student, former student, the professor now, Peter Allen, and I started to look at the where the vision fails or where the vision is not good enough. And of course, in, in, and here is my camera system, as you can see, in comparison to Jan Olof, is, is very clunky. And I had a puma arm, and I had a, a French finger. <laughs> I got it from, in collaboration with friends, which uh, was basically a finger, but looked a little bit like penis. And <laughs> but it had a lot of tactile sensors, you know, was, they had a conducting the rubber. But anyway, what we have shown that indeed vision is very good for, for broad range observation, for giving you the extent and, and the distance with, with the stereo system. We were able to get you the, these kind of um, geometric performance, but it wasn't very efficient to find out what is the, uh, what is the concavity. So, or for that matter, the, the hole was much faster with the finger to show where is the hole, because you just did one movement and you found that there was no material. So, so in, in fact, um, his thesis was about to show that indeed vision and touch can play together. And, and this is not a surprise, because in biology, that's what we do. Um, then later on, in 91, I had another student. As I said, this is a kind of more a, a review of history, where um, we had a project from the post office, bunch of, uh, on the assembly line, you have a bunch of packages of various side, and the question was, can you recognize and pick them up and sort them? And indeed, um, you can build a system which in that, that time had a, was basically a finite state machine, which also had um, uh, states that were, that were uh, detecting failures. So, but anyway, it, it con because it's a finite state machine as a model, we were able to terminate and show that it can terminate. And, and anybody who knows anything about 
finite state machines know that there is a final state and, and you terminate. Okay, so then um, later on in 95, uh, Luca Bogoni, my student, uh, we have looked at can we detect again by this interaction of vision and, um, and, um, and, and touch and manipulation um, properties of materials and shapes of materials. And here is basically the, the, the diagram. Here is the planner, then there is the overseer and controller, and then here is the low level, low level uh, sensor systems. Here is the vision and here is the, the manipulator. And indeed, I have only one more slide along these lines. We were able to, using at that time, um, there were no hybrid systems. Shankar didn't come out with that. With, I, I, we used discrete event systems, which was a precursor to hybrid systems. And to modeling this, and here is the control. As you can see, the, we, we had a limited number of shapes, of tools, and we, we could, uh, we could design the representation, which is really the thing that this workshop is about, the representation by exploration of the what, what does it mean with given set of materials piercing, for example. And piercing or cutting is not only a matter of hardness of the material, but it's also a matter of the shape of the tool that you interact with. And so, so we had this relationship between the, the tool and the forces and the shape and, uh, you know, and had, um, and so, we, so this whole system kind of shows you that you have the, the and, and how do you interact between the vision robot and the manipulatory robot which uh, ex exerts the forces um, test to test the cutting and piercing. <laughs> okay, so lessons learned. To build intelligent systems, one must carefully design observers. And I would say that that is really my shtick in this whole, whole thing, that you really need to think about um, what do you want to observe for a given task or for exploration and how you want to go about it um, in order to, uh, to design these intelligent systems. And you will see in my current work, that's exactly what, I, what I'm focusing on. Observer actuators, degree of freedom, controller, task managers, and overseers and planners. So you, you, you in any control uh, situation, you have to have some sequential steps, and that's where the planning comes about, you know. Otherwise, you are just doing a reactive. Given the about the issues are strategies for data acquisition, which modality to employ and when, okay? And that's where the planning comes about, or you have to somehow build it. Maybe the biological systems have an innate part of this, I, I'm not sure on that. How to sample the environment, because it's very clear from the 300 millisecond and the time as you are moving around, you don't have hours to, to, to sample, you know, exhaustively the whole environment. Randomly in exploration, task driven in a task is given. Optimization of resources. You don't have infinite in energy and you don't have infinite time, okay? And great opportunity for control community. So that sort of is addressed to all of us because I consider myself part of it. So, <clears throat> so now I will switch from the past to my current work. Today, humans interact with cyber physical systems on a daily basis. We wish to understand the dynamics of this interaction. Actually, I have to confess, so far, my results are pointing to kinematics of this interaction. I don't have the inertia, and I don't have the masses. 
I'm working towards it, but it's not yet there. So when is autonomous system versus human should be in control of the momentary situation. We have picked few tasks to study this dynamics. The, the interesting question to me is how do we interact with machines? Driving a car, flying an airplane, um, an elderly lady pushing a cart, you know? I mean, this is now very common. Um, even if two people holding hands and walking together, you know, is an interactive system because, you know, you, you step on your left foot and she steps on the right foot. Okay, so task, understanding people's physical activities, including walking and develop predictive theories of such. And that's primarily um, Ram Vasudevan's work. Uh, and I, I have some slides from him, but since he's talking, I will skip them if it's okay. Um, uh, using our understanding of such physical activities, develop an automated coaching architecture and feedback system in order to help people during their physical exercises. We have this collaboration with the Oregon Health Center where we are giving a, a three-dimensional vi vi visual capabilities for people to do exercise and capture how they are doing exercise while they are watching a coach. You know, some of you are probably too young to remember there used to be Jane Fonda tape, you know, and you would do exercise. Now there are somebody else's tape, but who cares? I mean, it's a coach who is sort of showing you what to do, and then, um, then you are doing it, and we capture that, and we compare, and the interesting thing, guess what it is? What feedback to give? In what form this feedback, okay? Should it be, and this is what we are now testing, should it be a, a simple, just a, a matching scores, you know? You, or should it be verbal, you did fine, no, sh push your shoulder up higher, or should it be overlay you over the, 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 the coach? It's not clear. That's what we, we, we had some preliminary tests, and I can tell you, older people don't want to see themselves for some reason. I guess they don't want to see their wrinkles, but whatever. They don't want, so we, we, we designed this interface of coach and, and the person, and they said, uh-uh, no, we just want to see the coach. So it's interesting. Well, this needs much more testing, but any case. And then trade-off in control between human driver and autonomous driver driving of the car, and this is really a serious problem. Again, you know, I was a black sheep when I started this thing, but now people are saying, oh yeah, yeah, we, we have a problem when people are picking up uh, texting and so while they are driving. So we are measuring that and um, hoping to, uh, to get some, uh, the, the interesting question is that when you are at fault, how should one uh, give the, uh, how should one take away the control of the car, of the driving, to the autonomous driver? Okay, that's the question. And then when should we give you the back? And you know, that's, that's what we are trying to see. All right, so now the action recognition. Uh, I have been looking at various, um, uh, papers in this domain, and uh, there are different connotations. In the computer vision uh, community, action recognition is really, uh, you are, are you shaking hands, or are you moving uh, in a crowd, or alone? So it, it has different connotations. So in our connotation, the different actions require humans to engage different joints of the skeleton at different intensity, energy level at different times. That's sort of our hypothesis. And hence, the ordering of joint based on the level of engagement across time should reveal significant information, you know, the, the kind of important information as, um, as um, Stefano will talk to us about, about the underlying dynamics, in other words, the invariant temporal structure of the action itself. So we have designed, um, we have designed 12 different activities, and 
no, actually this is shows 12 different people and uh, I am somewhere there, but I'm not sure. Anyway, but mostly young people. And uh, we have the skeleton, we have a motion capture of all these people, of these activities. And then we do the following. Uh, then we take these actions and measure uh, which, uh, via a histogram, which of the uh, which of the joints um, for given activity um, are more energetic. And the way how we measure it, we look at the, the, the variance of the, of the average, very simple measure. Anyway, oh, sorry, I, uh, I should be able to show you this, um, how it jumps. Well, oh, OK, here we are. It works. OK, so you can see this is throwing. And this throwing is interesting because you can see how the, the, the different energetic joints are changing. So the, and here, here is the annotation of which of the joints are. So this red one is clearly this elbow, and as I am, as you know, whoever is that throwing. Yes. So, yes? How, how, do you, how do you find out which one is more energetic? Uh, do you just measure the velocity? OK, OK. So let me show you. No, no, we don't measure. At this point, again, from robotics, we, me we actually measure x, y, z coordinate system from the motion capture. We take that motion ca x, y, z coordinate and transfer it into generalized coordinates from robotics. You know that, OK? So we have angles, OK? That's our first coordinate system. And uh, hold on, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I can. OK, so this one, throwing again subject. Then we create from these angles the amplitude, how, how high they, you know, how much they use. And we create this histogram. Okay. okay, and then we look at the the max, basically, all right, uh, and the variation, the max. Okay. So, so anyway, um, that's what we do. Okay. All right. Cool. Now, uh, I have some good news and some bad news. So, so the good news. So when we started to, this is joint work with uh, Rene Vidal, actually. Rene is interested to understand the representation so that then he can use it as a prior for the image analysis. I'm not interested in that, but, but this is great. Anyway, so we take the histogram of most informative joints and then histogram of motion words and then um, LDS parameters. And then uh, we look at the nearest neighbor, kernel, v, and the, 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 the lesson I learned, guys, that it's not only for representation. We are using classification of these 12 different activities, or 11, yeah, 12 different activities for classification. <coughs> and, how, and that's a measure for us. It's not an end goal, but it's a measure how well the representation works. And it's kind of is that feedback. Now, I saw that we, if we have a good feature vectors, that I am done. Well, it turns out that it's not good enough because you really have to pay attention to the distance metric, OK? Because the distance metric can really mess your, your, uh, your classification. And I have some evidence to that, regrettably. <laughs> OK. So, so anyway, so here is our first classification, and we compared it with the Max Planck Institute and Microsoft, and we have these, uh, the, the, the two most important uh, um, alphas, you know, the joints, and then the histogram of most important joints. And here is the classification results with SVM, we get 94.18 on our set data. 
on the Max Planck we get 84 and on the Microsoft we get rather poor results because the temporal sampling is very poor on Microsoft, 30 frames per second, while in our motion capture we have 445 frames per second. So the temporal sampling is, and you will see even further that the temporal sampling is very critical. Sorry, yeah, the, go ahead. The rows are different uh, distance, different distances? Uh, the, the rows are different features. And these are, and the columns are different uh, clustering methods. This is the nearest neighbor, SVM. And then this, this are different data sets. So what is H and V? Which one? H and V, so the third. H and V? H and W. No, H and W, sorry. No, H and W. Uh, no, I don't remember. Oh, no. No, these are the words. These are the, the uh, you know, vision wo words. So different features perform best in different data sets. Right. And with uh, very significant discrepancies. So right. One does twice as well on one data set and uh, significantly worse in another data set. Well, yes. And in fact, I, we elaborated on that further. Okay, so here we are. So does that say something about the feature, the distance, or does it say something about the data sets? Well, the first thing, okay, this data set I looked at more carefully, and it just has poor, poor temporal sampling, 30 frames per second. So both of these data sets, this one has around 195, <coughs> temporal sampling, and this one has 445, so it has the highest temporal sampling. Temporal sampling makes a difference, and I will show you why. So, you know, God bless uh, Rene, he kind of, well, we have every week conference calls, and so we question ourselves. So, so he said, I said, well, this, these uh, features uh, maybe can help us to do temporal segmentation. Because until now, we have done two ways of, remember, this is a, the whole tape of exercises. So how do you, how do you segment in temporal segmentation? So, so we have a, a fixed segment which means that each exercise, and they are different lengths, we segment into 50 different windows, OK? And here we got, rel and, and here in the second column, we took with each exercise, we took a fixed window size, one sixth of a second. So now remember that those exercises that are longer, all right, with the one sixth second get equally chopped as those are shorter. On the other hand, with the fixed segment, the shorter exercises get chopped finer because they are chopped into 50 segments. Now, we also realize that when you have a repetitive exercise, you know, like waving, for example, all right, and walking is one of those repetitive exercises, um, the, the, the most important feature, the, the most significant alpha is much more gives you much better results in classification than in those um, where you have just sit and stand, sit and stand, OK? The, or there, where the transitions really make the big difference. Because I move much slower than a youngster, OK? So I sit and then prepare standing, then stand up, 
and then still need a little time to balance, okay? So there are different stages. And so we divided the segments into repetitive and non-repetitive. And with the fixed segments, which are variable window sizes, we got, in fact, very good results around 90. I don't know if you can see it. And close to 95, 94, you know, with, um, uh, with the most significant features. Then we said, well, what about, uh, well, in this case, we have been using the two most significant joints. So this row is the same, except that we also said, OK, well, there must be a difference between this activity. So velocity vector, q, q dot, should make a difference. OK, so we computed the angular velocity. And it turns out that that didn't give us any much better. But when we combined the q and q dot, then we got very good results. Now, uh, we also looked at whether it makes a big difference if we take more than two more significant joints, if we take four the significant joints. And it turns out that it's, um, it's, it, it certainly didn't help. Now, we also looked at the normalized Lovenstein distance. Where, and I'm showing here only the non unnormalized Lovenstein. I, I don't know how many of you know what the Lovenstein distance metric, and this is related to the metrics, is it sort of uh, works on strings as opposed to Euclidean distance. And it measures how many changes you have to make on the string in order to match them. Now, the unnormalized Lovenstein distance, for some reason, um, has done better than before, than the normalized, and we are still mulling about it. So I have a couple of slides here, and then uh, how much time I have? My clock is completely you kaput. Like huh? You have like 10 minutes. 10 minutes, OK. But we need some questions. OK. So here is a subject 12, and I don't know who is the subject 12, but you see these are the, the joints. and. Um, and this is the, uh, the fixed window size segmentation. And you will see that. And this is the uh, 50 segments. And, and uh, you will see um, this is the throwing. And throwing is interesting because it's not repetitive. So it's sort of, you will see how, you know, it's, it's not repetitive. It's kind of you. You prepare, and then you throw, and then you get back. OK, so let me show you. Um, oh, no, this is not what I wanted to show. So why am I, OK. And so here are the angles, and here are the, uh, the, the derivatives. And uh, don't be confused with this red and this green, because it's the same. It's just, uh, you know, the, my postdoc who did this uh, um, didn't make it consistent. But they are the same joints, which are the right arm really makes a big difference. But you can see that this has very little repetitive, but it does have you know, and this is what we are, this is where we are showing how we are doing the temporal segmentation uh, based on, um, based on the, uh, based on the, these um, uh, measurements, okay? And indeed, if you do this segmentation, uh, you get much better classification results. So the temple, so the lesson here, ladies and gentlemen, is that picking up the right features and the right distance metric and the right window size are all three playing together in terms of recognition. 
Okay, so um, I have another uh, throwing object. I always lose the cursor. Okay, here. So you can see that the first derivative will give you a very nice, but also the angles. And so, so on the other hand, you will see punching for this subject will have a difference. So look at the, the histogram here. <coughs> and the punching got um, uh, this and, and, and you segment it that way. It's a very fine segmentation. But then here is the subject five. And if I can go back and forth, notice the histogram of the how different they are. Okay? And it's the same task, but different people. So that is another thing that one needs to consider when you really want to get the, you know, I mean, what we as a scientist are after is what are the invariances. And uh, with people, ain't that easy. So this is just very quickly introduction to Ram's work, because the reason I included this is, one, of course, I'm very proud of the work, but the other one is, um, is that, again, in walking, and I, I am hypothesizing the similar thing will happen in upper extremities. In walking, you have this beautiful thing of that the, as you step with your left foot and your right foot, you get the acceleration and the, the dynamics to zero. So you have a beautiful, natural way of switching between motion continuous motion, differential equation, as you talked about it, and then switching to another differential equation, but a different one. So it's a beautiful example of a, of a hybrid system as an appropriate model for, for walking. And I don't have results, but hopefully next time I will. The same thing happens when you are grasping. When you move towards an object and you hit the object, you, all your q dot and q dot dot are going to zero. So, and clearly, the dynamical system, the differential equation that moves you this way for reaching and then grasping and lifting will be very different. So that's where I am going as the next step. Thank you very much. Anyone has any questions? So in, yeah. the, in the motion capture yes. uh, experiments, the representation issue is sort of uh, uh, right in front of your eyes because you, you the, the, kind of the collector of data, has put uh, markers on joints because you know these are important. I, I come from this physics background <laughs> where I design controlled experiments so that I have some baseline, I, Stefano, so that, you know, if I know that under controlled situations, this is, this is the representation I'm getting, okay, then, then can I go to wild? So I guess my question is, so in that case, then you look at the data collected yes. from these data, right, right. and you determine that there are certain distances and certain temporal sampling right. uh, characteristics and certain features that That's map. exactly it. Yes. So if you have a video sequence where you don't know where the joints are, and suppose that you just track points that are not in the joints, they could be anywhere, right. do you expect that these choices would still be valid, or do you think that, that they are specific to that? Uh, so okay, so, so remember, I am doing some data reduction by looking, take, making assumption that normal human, you know, have a certain skeletal structure, which is a tree structure. 
and I am taking the max of that. And I'm now moving towards maybe grouping, you know, <laughs> because especially in these non-repetitive uh, activities, it's clearer to me that it's not only the most energetic joint, but maybe the, the, that is connected. It's a connected system, so I cannot ignore the other joints. OK. But, <coughs> but so now you are saying, well, can I take this to, let's say, optical flow or, you know, uh, or so? Um, that doesn't have the same structure, OK? Um, well, I, my, OK, temporal sampling will hold, I am pretty sure, OK? The distance metric importance will hold. It is the question, the features, you know, how do you, as I said, you know, you don't have time to process all the optical flow. I mean, right now, all the videos are stored a priori, and you do processing in the background, OK? But, but if you don't have that, then what is the data reduction you have to make to extract the invariant features of this generic scene? And I dare to say that it's not going to be um, that you have to know something about the structure. If, if you are on a football and you are watching the, f the ball, then it's reasonable assuming that it's a, it's a spherical you know, shape. So, so, you, so you expect that the joints will emerge uh, out of a uh, dimensionality reduction process? Yes. They will naturally emerge yes. because they yes. are what matters. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. So, uh, Rujan, I mean, yes, dovetailing on, on Stefano's question, I mean, do you think that most of these images, I mean, when we're doing sensor processing, we should be really focusing on trying to do it in a task-dependent fashion rather than sort of doing it completely arbitrarily, sort of building features sort of from nowhere? Do you think, I mean, that's what's missing right now in vision and in control that we really need to be thinking about it. The sensor is part of the task. Rather the than. sensor is part of the task, absolutely. And, um, you, know, you know, methodologically, I've, I like to start with a con constrained environment and constrained problem. Eventually, you want to go to an unconstrained. Once you have built up certain things, certain building blocks, is, but, but methodologically, I, I feel that we should be starting from some something that you can verify, yeah, and 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 test. Otherwise, you are dreaming. Okay, uh, I want to thank Ruchna for such a fantastic talk. Thank uh, you. <laughs> and well. It's